participants from 19 countries. So I'll say good day to everyone. There's no point in saying good morning or good night, or it's different in different parts here. Um, so similar to Pablo's talk, which is very um, anatomy correlated, I've wanted to talk about the strength funeral approach to skull-based lesions. Um, and uh, these days, we this is a very versatile approach for most of the skull-based lesions. Um, and given the current outbreak, there's been some reluctance to perform this uh, endoscopic operation. But we, even if you compromise um, on an, by another approach, we will still have to go ahead with this sort of approach with the right precautions. So various organizations and various national bodies have come up with their own solutions and various other techniques to prevent the spread of disease. But uh, for the sake of um, this talk, I will talk about what we do in terms of this skull based approach. First of all, a few basic things. Um, the, the skull based exposure uh, will require some preparation. You need to have a good knowledge about the anatomy of the nasal cavity, the spinal cavity, and also the skull base. That is absolutely necessary. And any, any time you spend in the, the lab is uh, not wasted. And uh, one thing shown here is the nasal septal flap, which has changed the practice of skull base surgery. The, the main concern was about the leak and the delayed healing, but um, with this flap, we have reduced the incidence of such complications to minimum. And you need to have a set, and, and in my unit, I use the kit, uh, the CASAM kit, could have a adequate bipolar, so scissors, and there are a variety of dual sealants. And in some cases, especially for vascular lesions, you may want to have additional capability to use the endosanin green. Um, Doppler is also a quite useful instrument during um, big operations, especially extended operations. And the nasal septal flap is supplied by the spinopalatin artery, but you need to make sure that um, you are not um, encroaching onto the um, olfactory epithelial um, area to avoid any loss of um, olfaction. And even if you do not have to take, even if you're not planning to take a flap in a standard pituitary clay case, it is a wise thing to remember that uh, you may not know what's going to happen once you go in. You may get a major leak, which you may have to repair with the flap. And so what I sometimes do is to um, use uh, something we call a rescue flap. I'm going to open up this. Um, going to open up this um, video, so I'll show you what the rescue flap is. So essentially, this is the the left nostril, and um, this is the left nostril, and we are just entering the spinal sinus. Uh, so this is the way area you can see the the, the, the anterior wall of the spinal. This is spinal sinus cavity. I'm just sort of dissecting off the the pedicle here, and we still can cut the mucosa here to access the the um, the middle of the spinal cavity. This is just moving the pedicle away. You're not actually creating a flap by cutting out the flap. You're just preserving it in case you need it. And if you don't need it, you don't have to use the flap. So that is what is meant by the rescue flap, and I'm doing it more and more frequently these days. Um, so in a standard pituitary tumor, you stay within the cell last stage. You don't have to go outside your um, cellar, and often even if you um, have to remove a tumor which, which is extending above the cellar space, often you can stay within the tumor, avoid entering into the intraclean space. But some tumors are quite massive, and they it can often involve vascular structures. Here you see the massive pituitary tumor is lobulating around the acorn complex. And there are multiple numbers. When you operate on this sort of tumors, often you will have to dissect it off and the, tu the, the tum lesions become extra capsular. So you have to be ready to access that part of the um, tumor. So for example, in a so here, this is the cellar stage and the standard 
practice is to this, always identify yourself with the midline. You always come back to the midline and, and that gives you orientation. And this is the, the right side and this is the left side. And here I'm curating out the tumor. This is a necrotic pituitary tumor. He came with a symptoms of pituitary apoplexy, but when I operated, it's all in fact a pituitary tumor. So it's all curating out the tumor from the base at six o'clock, and then the, you go on to the other side and go for the anterior bit at the end. Here, um, you are curating out the, the last, the tumor from the cellar, and, um, but the, you, you have to use you have to use um, um, techniques to avoid avoid um, uh, entering into the arachnoid space. So, show you what um, is a, a good practice is to use the patty. Here, I'm washing out the cavity here, and here I'm holding up the arachnoid dome. There is still a bit of tumor left behind, so I'm just uh, going to use my dissectors and cure it to cure it out the um, the last bit of the tumor, which is attached to the arachnoid dome. So you're using your patty as a dissector. And so you don't, you're not going to cause any arachnoid leak. And um, you can push it up and you can also look, go inside the pituitary fossa to have a clear view of the remnant. Here the, the last bit is taken out and also watch out for the pituitary gland. So that is one important uh, message I have to give. Before, before you start the operation, always look at where the pituitary gland is. On the MRI scan, try to identify the, the pituitary gland. So, and the instruments that should be uh, working in good um, way. And uh, there are different techniques to arrange your monitors and the way you work with your ENT surgeon. And some units may not work with their ENT colleagues, but I prefer to use my ENT colleagues to, for the exposure. And often for follow-up, um, they will be uh, quite um, helpful in terms of following these patients. So some of these patients may get uh, long-term nasal problems. Because you are operating it through a narrow corridor, the instruments are straight shafted instruments. And you can understand if you place your endoscope to one side, you often hit your instruments with the endoscope. We call it sword fighting. So in order to avoid you need to have a, an END surgeon or your colleague who's driving the endoscope um, do it in a harmonious way. They have to, it's like a dance or like a figure skating or a, like a uh, synchronized swimming. You have to be adaptable for your each surgeon's uh, maneuver. And um, one way to avoid sword fighting is to try and shift the center of action to one side rather than uh, keeping it in the middle of the screen. And Navigation is quite useful, especially for complex lesions of the skull base. And some of the pituitary, some of the sphenoid sinus is quite smooth. You don't have any septation, but sometimes you can have very multi-septate uh, uh, pituitary uh, sphenoid sinus, which can uh, cause confusion in terms of the anatomy. But the main thing you have to remember is that the carotid impressions are on either side, the left and right. And if you know the, the landmarks, you should be able to avoid damaging these structures. Because one of the main nightmare or complications related to a transvenal operation is injuring the carotid, and that makes a very bad day. Um, so the, the way you to, to avoid that, you have to keep that, keep that um, uh, complication in your mind all the time whenever you are operating on skull-based lesions. The best way to do, even though you may have navigation, the best thing is to do is to always get your landmarks right. Here you can see the midline. So you keep your view with the six o'clock to 12 o'clock position on the screen and all the time come back to the midline. So then you know where you are from, away from the carotid and the important structures. You can see the optic nerve impression here and the paraclinal carotid coming up to here, the cavernous sinus carotid, and then it forms a loop, and then you have the paraclival carotid. The two most common positions where you get damage is the paraclinal carotid and also the clival carot carotid, the paraclival carotid, especially when you're drilling. So it is important to have some interventional backup if you ever get into trouble, um, if you, especially if you're planning to do big um, skull-based tumors like chondromas or meningiomas or even big uh, craniopharyngiomas. Here, this lady had a meningioma, which we took 
uh, to theater to do an endoscopic approach, but unfortunately, um, there was a, a interoperative hemorrhage from the carotid to, uh, near the paracline of the carotid, and she was taken to the intermethylate tube to get it embolized with the balloon. And then a week later, she was taken back to the, the theater for resection of the tumor. Here you can see that balloon staring at you from that hole in the carotid. So this is important to know that you can easily um, get a carotid injury. The other place where you get damage to the carotid is uh, when you drill the clivus, especially for invasive tumors. Um, or um, I'll, I'll show you one video where um, there were some near misses where you could have easily injured the so this is an invasive pituitary adenoma where I'm drilling uh, near the... So this is, this is the, the pituitary fossa. You can see my cursor moving. That's the, that's the cella with the tumor. But also this tumor is invading the, the clivus and also the posterior clinoid. So I'm trying to drill off the carotid. And this is, I possibly misjudged my um, the impression and I probably was too close to the carotid. And also this, this is, um, after a while you can see, I mean, it, the carotid eventually was exposed um, here. That, that is the carotid there, um, but um, it was in, un, intact. So these are near misses. So on ha always has to learn from such cases where you, especially around the uh, clival, paraclival carotid. So paraclinoid carotid and paraclival carotid. These are the two areas where you have to be careful, especially if you, if you have to drill and, and uh, expose that part of it. This is another invasive picture to tumor with acromegaly. It's a young chap uh, where um, I was uh, drilling near the carotid to So this is the, so this is the, so you can see it's here. So that is the carotid, paraclival carotid exposed by the drilling. I didn't have to expose it, but um, it was quite close. Sometimes you can have a more medial position of the paraclival carotid. And that carotid, you can see the, the pulsation of the carotid. So one has to be very careful when drilling the paraclinoid carotid. So just to emphasize this point, so this is, this is your landmarks. When you do a transclival approach, you have to limit the carotid. And even if you are not doing a transclival procedure, you are drilling near the carotid and one has to be really careful, use the diamond drill and, and you just, if you have to expose that, you just have to make sure that you're not um, injuring the carotid and thin, it out, thin out the bone and then you can break off the bone. So craniopharyngiomas are good indication for extended procedures as well. And these are one of the, uh, the, the, the ideal cases for endoscopic approaches. For example, this man came with a, a progressive uh, craniopharyngioma, it's a high functioning individual with a visual compromise. And um, the approach involves extending the, um, the cell opening into the tubercular. And most of the craniopharyngiomas you can expect approach it through the transtubercular approach. Even you don't have to go beyond or more anterior to tuberculum. You can always uh, restrict your uh, bony resection to the tuberculum area. And then you go in front of the pituitary gland. And in cases where the tumor is mostly anterior to the pituitary gland, you often you can leave the pituitary floor intact. This is where um, you dissect off the, um, the craniopharyngioma from the, uh, um, the other structures around. Sometimes the craniopharyngioma can be um, can be quite uh, adherent to the uh, structures, including the optic chasm. For example, this is a young police officer who uh, was operated um, two three years ago. You can see the craniopharyngioma wall is quite thick, but it's it's uh, adherent to the structures. And there will be structures like super, superior hypophysal artery coming from the carotid artery going towards the optic chasm. You can see the optic chasm here. And, um, and there will be struck the vessels like this, fine vessel, which will be supplying the capsule probably, may not be supplying it, but maybe uh, coursing through it, one has to be really careful to avoid injuring those vessels. 
So this is a part of the epic chiasm is uh, stuck to the capsule here, so one has to be really gentle. Here you can see how much of adherence there is. That, that one is best to leave it alone rather than risking the microcirculation of the optic chiasm. The ACOM complex you can see really well here. Um, so that, that is the So that is um, the cranial pharyngiomas, which uh, one has to be careful about. And uh, he remains disease-free um, after many years. Some of the cranial pharyngiomas are often difficult to resect completely. For example, something like this, when the cranial pharyngioma is attached to the lateral, the medial wall of the third one, all you can do is to remove the solid part of it, but try not to disturb the medial hypothalamic walls. And um, the Often you can find that the cranial pharyngeum is attached to the infundibular stalk, and that, that becomes a problem. It's ideal to avoid pituitary stalk injury, but if you need a complete resection, in many cases, one may have to consider transecting the stalk. And uh, I do that as a second stage. I don't do it primarily. Only if it comes back, I tend to do um, an elective resection of the pituitary stalk and knowing the content in the patient beforehand. So this is, as I mentioned, about the superior hypoposial branches, and the pituitary stalk also is often at preservation side here. And so when you operate on chordomas and chordosarcomas, many tumors to the clivus, the vertebral artery perforators are quite um, important. The way you um, use your suction and your instrument to, to peel off the tumor away from the perforator, you can see a perforator here. So this is the meningioma, uh, which was being debulked. And um, this is a man who had a large chordoma, um, which was resected um, three, four years ago. So the, you can see all the perforates as a preserve here. And uh, by the side of it, the, the six was, six was going by the side of it just here. So it's another young man with um, a, a cranial pharyngioma. So some of the two, uh, lesions, like arachnoid cyst. This is a, a lady who came to me after being followed up for an arachnoid cyst for many years by a pediatric hospital. But she, when she became an adult, the cyst started growing back and then she was, started, she was uh, getting visual problems. So eventually she wanted to have the surgery done. Initially I did it through the endoscopic approach to the nose to drain it. But this, the problem with arachnoid cysts is that they often recur in spite of you draining it. So for her, I had to go through the head to drain it. Um, in spite of that, she again leaked when I had to go back into the nose to repair it. So you sometimes you need multiple operations for this lesion. So at this point, my strategy for I consist of the cell and supracellar space is to try and do a standard supraorbital mini craniotomy and train the cyst and masticulate the cyst as much as possible. So another young man, a librarian with an arachnoid cyst where I did a supraorbital approach not then endoscopic approach. So it's tempting to do endoscopic approach and trans penal approach for these lesions, but I prefer not to um, these days. Um, this is a, a young guy of investment banker in London uh, with a Ratki cyst, which uh, came and somebody drained it initially, left the, uh, some tissue there, and then promptly came back. Then I had to ex excise the lesion to an extended approach. You can see the clear um, space after excision of the tumor with the, the P cone going up there and the, the bacilli here, the P1 here, and the, the, the medial thalamic perforators are here, the mammillary bodies here, and the floor of the third ventricle cell. set. Um, so, but then this is a case where I left a remnant of the lesion around the, the, around the infundibular stalk, but it came back six months, started growing. Eventually, I had to take him back to theater to reoperate. So when you go back after uh, such operations, you can see how well the, the flap has taken up. But the only problem is that there is no landmarks. You have to rely on your navigation to get some idea where you are. So it is really possible to go back in such cases, but also can make it difficult. So then he remains disease free where I had to resect his um, infundibular stock and he has um, DI which he's managing with uh, DDAVP. Also have to be careful in some recurrent cranial pharyngiomas. This is a young chap I operated. 
after he was operated many times before uh, through transliminal route. After the operation, he woke up fairly late, sort of delayed fashion. His recovery was very slow for a few days in the ward. And you can see why, because his cordial nucleus shows some infarct on the right side. But uh, he remains disease free after all these years, because some of the vessels, especially recurrent kidneys, can some of the branches of the main perforator, the perforators can get attached to these vessels and you've got to be careful. This is a man in his 70s who came two, three years ago with a large um, clival tumor. It's a cordoma, which has been growing within six months time. So here, um, the cordoma is being debulked through a transclival approach. So uh, the limit of the, the clival, the recession is on either side of the, the carotid. That determines your um, view. If you limit yourself too narrow, it really becomes difficult to dissect off the bacillar and dissect off the perforators and also the cranial nerves around it. He had a pacemaker, I couldn't get a CT MRI scan initially. So the, init the immediate post op scan shows complete resection. But within six months, his tumor came back around the lateral aspect and also he had multiple dissemination lower down as well. So cordomas are sometimes difficult, especially if, they are pro if their pro proliferation potential is very high. And there's some unusual cases where you can also use a transfuneral approach for aneurysms of the ACOM complex, which is a case I did after clipping uh, two aneurysm higher up. There's one aneurysm here, um, which, was, which uh, caused the bleeding. And there was another one there. And these two were clipped uh, through a transfuneral approach when she came with the bleed. Subsequently, she came back uh, when we uh, had to treat this one. And that uh, approached it through an endoscopic approach. As you can see, these are more challenging operations um, and they you needed separate um, instruments to do that. So I think I'm reaching my um, time here. So I'm going yes, to start. Sure a few questions. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, Ramesh, one of the questions here is, um, if you don't always use a nasal flap, how do you close the post-operative deficit? That's come from Razim Agev. So nasal separate flap is often used for a, a large tumor, especially when you have large defect. And if you're taking off the tuberculum or planum or even anteriorly, you need a big long flap for that. And if you're not using it, for example, if you're using it, if you're, if you're doing the operation for a standard fitted tumor, the only thing I do is to cover that uh, gap with an artificial substitute. Neither you can, if there is no leak, I don't really bother using any dual substitute. I just use uh, a sponge side like material to cover the gap. And then one may use some packing material within the uh, senoid sinus, but generally for a standard epidural tumor, I just use a sponge stand and that's it, nothing else. Thank you. And then the, the next question is about using the Doppler for the carotid. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so Doppler. Doppler SCG, Doppler is a useful instrument when you can actually see the carotid. For example, if you're if you're doing an invasive cavernous sinus tumor, if you are an invasive pituitary tumor invading the cavernous sinus and you have taken the tumor out, then you can you know where the carotid is and you can you can get the pulsation from it, and then you can use the Doppler to confirm it. But if you want to find out where the where the carotid is, for example, like a paraclive carotid, if you are going to use the Doppler on the bone, you will not get it. And, but unless there is a dehiscence, for example, in some patients, you may get a dehiscent a bony covering of the paraclinoid carotid. And then you can directly um, get the, uh, the Doppler uh, on it. Then you can uh, identify it. But often it is when you drill off the bone and then you um, have to confirm the, the vessel, especially when you cannot see it in the cavernous sinus, you can use the, um, use the Doppler. Um, uh, we're going to take a more questions. Salman, you're the next speaker, just so, you, just so you're aware. You'll be coming on shortly. Uh, but before that, there's another question here from uh, Manuel from, uh, I'm probably pronouncing this wrongly, Encarnacion. Uh, he's from Moscow. And his question is about um, how you deal with ab aberrant uh, anatomy, on nodi cells, accessory turbinates. Uh, yeah, right. so yeah. I didn't show that slide. Um, the best thing, um, I think this, this is why the interaction is so good rather than the slides, because the best I mentioned about learning the um, studying the scans before, for example, if you're operating on a pituitary tumor or any other tumor around the pituitary or craniopharyngeal meningitis or any tumor coming from the pituitary gland, you have to 
try and, as much as possible to find where the influenza level is deviating to, where the pituitary is, uh, is deviating to. And that gives you an idea where you're going to and expect during the operation. Same as onidy cells and other anatomical variations. Study the CT as carefully as possible. You can see those variations in your CT. And then, you know, if you have an onidy cell and exposed to optic nerve, then you should be prepared to encounter it. So studying those images carefully, the CT scan and the MRI scan, is the best way to not to have any surprises and to make un inadvertent injuries to any of the critical structures. Okay, Ramesh, thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, please type in your questions. We'd, we'd like to answer them at the end. I'm sure uh, Pablo is online. He's answering questions. So people have been putting them up. So keep, keep bringing them in. I'm 